Okay, looks like we can start this um, incredible event today. I hope you all are excited. Um, aloha and welcome to this Climate Action Planning Forum. My name is Tyler Levine, and I'm here both as a part of the Hawaii Environmental Change Agents Planning Committee, um, and I'm also representing the Hawaii Youth Climate Coalition. Let us open up this space together, setting the intention of creating a safe, loving, kind community of connections and infinite wisdom, expanding far beyond the virtual presence of us all. I'm here today to really only state one phrase, and that is thank you. Though this phrase really lacks the justification of expressing all that I feel within my heart, it is a start. Um, and I would like to thank all the legislative chairs and attendants today, as well as the participating organizations. Um, I also want to thank each and every person as an individual, a part of this intergenerational community um, here today to discuss legislative priorities and collaborate on past, present, and future action items in the all-encompassing realm of our climate. Um, just to say a few more things, I think that we are all branches um, reaching in different directions, connected by a single tree. It is time that we bend away from grasping the sun for a second and fold our intention to the earth mother as she cradles us with nourishment and reminds us that we are all one. Um, the roots of connection from which we grow shall be acknowledged today, uniting us on this common ground of climate change as we uh, really strive to grow a collective movement beyond the lines of limitation and walls of separation within society. I think that there are rarely times such as these when we get to witness the full picture of what makes up this tree, what makes up our tree. Um, so today I ask you not to look into the lens of your computer, computer cameras or the boxes on um, your screen, but I ask you to really look into the heart of the messages that um, we are planting today as the seeds, the seeds that is going to grow, you know, a forest of trees and the seeds that will grow uh, our future hopefully below two degrees. Um, now I'd like to introduce our moderator for today, Ted Bolin. Ted was a deputy attorney general for the past 15 years, helping protect Hawaii's waters. And he is now an environmental advocate on climate and coral reef issues. So I'm handing it off to you, Ted. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tyler. And welcome to all. This is an exciting day for us. We've been trying to get this together for a while. I've been dreaming of doing this for two years, of getting people together before the session begins, because once the session starts, uh, it gets fast and furious and really too much going on. So we need to uh, talk about the issues here with climate, which I think we all recognize as being a existential crisis, at least something that we need to get to work on right now. And I appreciate all of you coming on board for that work on climate and other environmental issues. We are going to try to get together today with uh, various issues that people will work on and form coalitions that I hope before session people can get together and decide what bills should look like. So let's kick it off. Uh, here's what today's program includes. Uh, first, we will have uh, Dr. Charles Chip Fletcher give a speech on COP26 musings because he's just been over in Glasgow and he can update us. We will review our objectives and introductions, uh, legislative climate priorities, sponsor priorities, breakout session, reports from breakouts, making a difference, and a closing. Uh, the first half, we will have essentially uh, presentations by legislators. We have three chairs with us today that we'll talk about in a moment. We have, uh, we'll then have uh, question and answers for them. We, in the second half, will turn to breakout rooms and you can pick from among seven different breakout topics that most interest you and meet with other people on that for about 15 minutes. We'll discuss that. Then we will come back and we'll report on what was said during the breakout sessions. 
finally, uh, we'll see where we're, we'll have some discussion about where we might go next. So that's our, that's our basic direction today. And let me uh, turn it now to uh, Chip Fletcher. Uh, Dr. Fletcher is the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology, or SOEST, at the University of Hawaii in Manoa. He is also a commissioner on the Hawaii Climate Change Commission. He has been the principal funder, principal advisor in funding and awarding over 30 graduate research degrees and has received a number of teaching, research, and community service awards. Chip also has a textbook on climate change entitled Climate Change, What the Science Tells Us. His models of sea level rise are used by government agencies to administer coastal policy and plan resilient infrastructure uh, projects. So Dr. Fletcher is right at the center of this issue that is such concern to us all. And with that, I will ask uh, uh, Dr. Fletcher to give us a little summary of what he's learned recently in Glasgow. Thank you, Dr. Fletcher. Thanks, everybody. Uh, let me share a screen and start just a couple of PowerPoint slides. Um, so I'm, I'm calling this a climate update. I'm going to do just a, a few seconds of review and then uh, bring us on to where we are today globally with respect to uh, national commitments and uh, pathways to limit global warming. So as most of you know, uh, in 2015, the Paris Climate Accord occurred and nations uh, agreed to stop global warming before it reached two degrees Celsius and to pursue efforts to end warming before reaching 1.5. But in 2018, a report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change labeled global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius revealed that warming above 1.5 would be a major disruptor to global security and economic stability. And with this report, 1.5 degrees C became the new global target for limiting warming. In order to stop warming at 1.5 degrees C, it means global emissions must be reduced 55% by the end of this decade and much, must reach uh, net zero emissions by 2050. And um, I'll mention that to date, warming has reached between 1.1 and 1.3 degrees Celsius. So we're only a few tenths of a degree Celsius shy of our 1.5 target. By the end of the Glasgow meeting last month, national pledges, national promises to cut greenhouse gas emissions would only amount to reductions of 7.5%, whereas 55% is what is needed. This gives us a 34% probability of staying below two degrees Celsius and only a 1.5% probability of staying below our primary target of 1.5 degrees Celsius. So we are way off. Additionally, a Washington Post study last month found that an average 23% of greenhouse gas emissions are not reported. Carbon dioxide emissions dipped 5.4% during 2020. However, they've rebounded this year 4.9%. And they're projected to reach over 36 billion tons of CO2 by the end of this year, which is only eight tenths of 1% below their pre-pandemic high in 2019. So this black line shows our historic carbon dioxide emissions over the past decade. This dip uh, was the COVID recession. Our goal is to reduce emissions in order to stop warming. This yellow line shows the announced promises nationally, which would put us on a pathway of warming between 2.5 and 2.8 degrees Celsius. But what nations promise and what they actually do are two different things. Very few nations actually hold to their promises. And the uh, policies that are uh, in fact in play nationally around the world put us on a pathway of warming to over three degrees Celsius. 
studies show that above three degrees Celsius, we're basically looking at one third of humanity displaced from where they're located today because their lands will become too hot to live in. About one fifth of the global land surface will become intolerably hot and not able to sustain human communities. This green line is the pathway we must follow in order to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. It's been projected that uh, children born now will experience two to seven times uh, an increase in extreme events, extreme weather events compared to people born in 1960 under current promises. And this consists of seven and a half times as many heat waves. That is, whereas those of us born uh, 50, 60, 70 years ago have experienced an average of four heat waves in our lives, children born today will see 30 heat waves. Already, 37% of warm season heat related deaths are attributed to climate change. And extreme humid heat overall is more than doubled in frequency since 1979. It rained on the Greenland summer, uh, summit this summer. And um, this is the first sign of the Greenland ice sheet moving through a tipping point phase because uh, as it lowers in elevation due to melting and rainfall, the probability of rain begins to increase and the probability of snowfall decreases. The Amazon basin is now converted to a net greenhouse gas emitter. Studies have been coming out all year showing that uh, damming of the rivers, uh, wildfires, uh, intentional fires, deforestation, uh, hunting, mining, uh, and drilling have all reduced the net biomass of the Amazon basin by nearly one third. Uh, and the Amazon itself overall um, is a net source of greenhouse gas every year. We also have seen studies that the continental biome is nearing its thermal maximum for photosynthesis. It's been projected that by 2040, uh, just two decades from now, the uh, drawdown of carbon from the atmosphere may be cut in half because of photosynthesis nearing its thermal maximum. But I remind you that crisis has a second less well-known meaning from the original Greek. It actually means a turning point or an opportunity. There's never been as much innovation, investment, and interest in green technology. The revolution in renewables have soared from a niche interest 30 years ago to a cheap global alternative energy source that provides more than one quarter of the world's electricity today. And this is truly one of humanity's most remarkable achievements. We're on the right path. We just need to accelerate. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Dr. Fletcher. Um, I think a lot of us on the call are aware of how dire the situation is. I appreciate your last note on opportunity. I wonder if we could ask you what uh, you learned, what you learned specifically in Glasgow uh, and, how, and how it has changed your views, if at all, uh, since before the COP26. Well, my main takeaway from Glasgow uh, is that the UN um, Framework Convention on Climate Change, which hosts these annual meetings called COPs, is fundamentally a political process. And the fundamental tool of politics is compromise. And compromise is not the right approach when it comes to safety. And we're talking about our children's safety, our own safety. Uh, None of us would ever compromise on safety. So while the COP process uh, is, a, is an important and strong process and every year does achieve wonderful things, I think that uh, the organizers of COP need to put science first and they need to actually focus on the developing world, the world which is converting to a uh, modern system of health, modern system of transportation and education, and our funding should go towards India. It should go towards helping China. It should go towards helping African nations and Central American nations convert this decade into renewable economies. 
rather than nation by nation uh, having to uh, debate and eventually water down uh, globally consistent agreements because the, the COP process requires that every single nation that is a member uh, agree to the wording. Um, I would much rather see uh, in global investment in the developing world. This will also help with human uh, equality, which is extremely important. And I'd also ask, what kinds of solutions can people on this call work on uh, in their own lives uh, to try to help? Well, of course, there's there's voting. Absolutely, voting is the most important thing any of us can do in the democratized world. Um, secondly, a more plant-based diet is extremely important, and it's also better for you. It's healthier for you. Um, and just flat out getting away from the consumption of beef, which is largely produced by the deforestation of biodiverse countries in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and thirdly, here in Hawaii, uh, we have played an important global role as a leader, a demonstration of what, what is achievable. Um, in the 2000s, we were the most oil dependent state in the nation. And now um, we have emerged, and I, I think we may be the least oil dependent, least fossil fuel dependent state in the nation. Uh, I in, am personally uh, excited about the possibility of changing our refinery from a coal and oil based refinery to an atmospheric direct air capture refinery. We are a tur tourism based economy. Uh, we spend billions of dollars on producing aviation fuel from crude oil that is brought in from Russia and Libya. And we could produce aviation fuel by directly pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, combining it with green hydrogen that we can produce and making all of our fuels. Uh, we eventually will get away from combustion engines, uh, but it's going to be more than a decade before long haul aviation gets away from internal combustion. And uh, in the meantime, I think we can invest in uh, synthetic fuel production from direct air capture of CO2. And I went to Iceland after the COP meeting and, and looked at sequestration and geothermal and hydrothermal energy production there. Uh, I also, and, and I'll end with this, I think that geothermal is, uh, we, we really need to look again at geothermal, figure out how to do it right, have a community-based, community benefit-oriented geothermal um, energy production system in Hawaii, because uh, it can be done. Thank you, Dr. Fletcher, for your comments, for your uh, work in this field, and for coming to our session today. It's a great to have you here as a keynote speaker. And uh, appreciate you very much your being here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, next, uh, let's talk about the objectives of our event today. We are to enable support of key legislative climate priorities, to raise awareness of key community priorities with legislators, and enhance collaboration between environmental groups and with our legislators. And here are our chairs. So we'll turn, we'll turn now to the uh, section of the program where we are fortunate to have three of the environmental chairs from the Hawaii legislature who have a significant role in passing legislation related to climate and environment. And so let me kick it off by introducing Senator Mike Gabbard. Senator Gabbard currently serves as chair of the Committee on Agriculture and Environment. He represents Hawaii's 20th Senate Senatorial District and has served in the Hawaii State Senate since 2006. Senator Gabbard has been instrumental in passing legislation to protect our environment, including our coral reefs and oceans, and he has led efforts to mitigate the existential threats posed by the climate crisis. So with that, I would turn this over to Senator Mike Gabbard to give us a few remarks. Mike? Mahalo, Ted. Um, aloha, Mike Ako, and I hope you and your Ohana are safe, well, and that you all had a nice Thanksgiving. I apologize. I just got back from Phoenix where I spent Thanksgiving with family, and I've got a bad cough and just really feeling uh, under the weather. Uh, so I'm going to just, uh, I'm turning it over to uh, Corrine, my uh, committee clerk. She'll be taking over right after I speak. So I look forward to watching the recording. 
But I, I first want to mahalo all of you who were involved in putting this follow-up event together. And as I said at the September 18th uh, HICA event, you know, this is such a great idea. It just makes sense that, you know, inviting all the stakeholders to get together and talk story before session starts. And so here we're conveniently doing it online once again. And so uh, this follow-up meeting, we were asked to provide our top three priorities and to be more specific to climate bills. And I know I have only five minutes, so let's go. So one of my priorities is the Green Amendment uh, SB 502, which I introduced last session, uh, but it did not make it to the finish line. Uh, green amendments are provisions added to the Bill of Rights section of a constitution that, that recognize and protect the rights of all people, regardless of race, ethnicity, religion, or income, including future generations. Pure water, clean air, a stable climate, and healthy environments. So SB 502, it would amend our state constitution to protect those rights and could be used in cases where those rights are being threatened. Uh, our state constitution, it currently protects our environmental rights to some extent, but only as set forth in laws and implemented by agencies. Um, we can update uh, support for green amendments uh, is getting momentum in other states as other legislatures are beginning to to recognize the power in, in including such basic and strong language in a, in a state constitution's Bill of Rights. Uh, Pennsylvania and Montana, they passed their green amendments back in the early 70s. And just last month, I think it was November 3rd, New York became the third state in the country to pass a, a green amendment. Uh, Hawaii is one of 12 states that have proposed bills that are being put forth by legislators. And a reminder that it does require a two-thirds majority in each chamber of the, uh, of the legislature to pass. And then it would be on the ballot. A ballot question would be uh, there this coming no next November, excuse me. And that uh, ballot question would require a simple majority by voters. And so if approved, it would protect such rights for present and future generations. Uh, secondly, another priority I have is the uh, Carbon Positive Incentive Program. It was SB 493 from last session. And this bill sets up a Hawaii Ag and Forest Carbon Positive Incentive Program that will keep forests and working ag lands intact and sequester additional carbon on those lands. Uh, the bill would encourage the sequestration of atmospheric carbon gases by making it easier for farmers and landowners to get contracts for engaging in regenerative ag and sustainable uh, forest practices. So we must all do, we, we have to do all we can to reduce our carbon footprint and become carbon negative as soon as possible. And in striving to do this, it's not enough to limit greenhouse gas emissions. We must also draw carbon down from the atmosphere. A substantial sequestration of carbon is needed as well as major uh, greenhouse gas emissions controls. So the funding for this would be from a portion of the revenues generated by the barrel tax. Uh, Hawaii Ag and Forest Carbon Positive Incentive Program is vital to support our local producers and reach a carbon neutral clean economy by 2045. And then finally, my other priority is the uh, visitor green fee. Uh, as we all know, our beaches, reefs, ocean forest parks, and other natural resources are, are part of what makes Hawaii such a special place. And these natural resources, they provide billions of dollars of value to the state's economy and are a vital piece of our, our tourism industry, helping to sustain the well-being of our, of our communities. But because of too many tourists, Hawaii's natural resources are being negatively affected and will face new challenges with climate change. Uh, last session, it was our WAM chair, uh, De Senator De La Cruz, who introduced SB 666. Um, uh, and it proposed to establish a green fee surcharge of $20 on transient accommodations for the purposes of, of funding workforce programs and services that promote certain uh, environmental goals. So it proposed a 10-year pilot green fee sur surcharge and set up a special fund. So there's growing interest and support in the, in the belief that visitors can and should contribute a green fee surcharge to help preserve our natural resources. And this visitor green fee campaign, it could provide ways to enhance job opportunities in terms of literally creating thousands of green jobs and elevating the overall visitor experience as well. So, I mean, to me, it's, it's truly a no-brainer. 
uh, we should all pay our fair share in, in protection of our island's beauty and bounty. So in closing, I just, um, well, I just shared my top three priorities. I know there are many more issues and concerns that affect Hawaii and its people uh, that will be equally and thoroughly considered as we move through the next session. Now is the time to start sharing those. Uh, we're in the tweaking mode right now of previous bills. That, uh, so please let me know your thoughts about other bills or even concepts that you'd like to see passed into law. There's more to be done. And with these continued collaborative efforts, such as this meeting, it's my hope that we'll get the kinds of results that we can greatly benefit from. So, and with your continued support, I look forward to, to more successes next session. So aloha and mahalo and have a safe holiday. Thank you, Senator Gabbard. Aloha, mahalo to you as well. Uh, I wanted to ask one question for you, if you would. Um, and that is the Green Constitutional Amendment is a big, it sounds like a wonderful concept. But some people are afraid of large changes. What would you say to people who say this is too much of a change? Uh, I think it's a good question, Ted, because that's some of the blowback we got when we heard the bill. Is that, oh my God, you know, this is it just education, basically, right? We just need to educate that this this elevates the whole issue of of our environment and, and, and good air and good water, et cetera. I mean, look, look, look at what's happening with Red Hill right now. I mean, we're, it's all on the front pages, right? And I, I think, um, yeah, basically just education. Thank you. And thank you for your presentation. Thank you. And, 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 and please stay well. <laughs> Aloha, thank you. Thanks, thanks for coming when you're under the weather. Appreciate that. Aloha. Aloha. Next, our next speaker is Nicole Lowen. She's the chair of the Energy and Environment, Environmental Protection Committee of the legislature. She's a representative for House District 6 in Kailua Kona on Hawaii Island. And, she, and throughout her nine years in office, Representative Lowen has worked on legislation to further Hawaii's environmental goals, renewable energy to address climate change, protect natural resources, and to improve waste management systems. She has also prioritized work on clean transportation and energy efficiency and passed bills to transition state fleets to zero emission vehicles to incentivize the build out of electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Senator, excuse me, Representative Lowen has, has been a stalwart on the environment in the uh, House for a number of years, as I said, and uh, appreciate having you come today to speak. So with that, I'll turn the microphone over to Senator Lowen. Thanks. I think you. I think you uh, promoted me to senator last time too. But <laughs> I'll take it. Thanks. Um, can you guys see my screen share? Is that my PowerPoint visible? Okay. Um, I'll go th through this really quickly. Uh, sorry, I'm not good at picking just three priorities. Um, and this is uh, basically the same presentation I gave last time with some tweaks as we've moved closer to session. Things are changing, and things will probably continue to change. Um, and this is obviously not an exhaustive list, um, but uh, the first uh, uh, category, I guess, is energy and climate mitigation and, and decarbonization. So I would say my priorities here are um, uh, we have we're going to introduce a bill to update the state's uh, decarbonization goals. So there was Act 234 of 2007 that had a goal to reduce emissions below 1990 levels by 2020. So we've reached that, and now there's no further goals until our 2045 clean, econ clean economy goal, essentially. So we're looking at a bill that would require 70% reduction over 2005 levels by 2030, economy-wide. That would include uh, aviation fuel, which has been often excluded from that conversation and is uh, more, more ambitious than the Biden administration's goals right now. So I think it's a... Um, it's a good place to start, but still like in that that realm of what I think people will see as being achievable. Um, another priority uh, bill that I'm working on is, um, well, we're going to continue to have conversations about carbon pricing and carbon taxes. Um, and one uh, angle I've been thinking about taking since we haven't had luck in passing those bills in past years is uh, pivoting to thinking about an implicit or internal carbon price and the social cost of carbon. So this would be directing the state to adopt a uh, social cost of carbon and use that in their considerations for like big infrastructure projects and things like this. So this would push the state towards um, 
you know, not always picking the lowest cost if more energy efficiency or putting PV on a rooftop or using more um, lower carbon footprint building materials is cheaper. This would level level that out because you would be thinking more long term. And then in addition, we would direct the PUC to um, estimate a, a social cost of carbon and direct the utilities to use that in their planning process. So this would, uh, which I think that, that, you know, HEI and KIUC are already doing in large part, but um, this would internalize that emissions conversation because right now we have our RPS goals, but those don't explicitly relate to admission uh, emissions. So um, having a social cost of carbon be part of the planning process would um, internalize that. And then I appreciate that Chip mentioned geothermal. I think um, you know we, we've we have some drafts of bills. Uh, DLNR is not that happy with them because it impacts the, the money that goes to them right now. Uh, but I do think that we need to continue to elevate this conversation. And I think this group that you've brought together here today could be really helpful because there is a lot of suspicion um, and kind of mixed feelings surrounding geothermal. And I think that we need to work through that so that we can move forward uh, with you know, being able to benefit from this amazing resource that we have here and, and use that to help us um, tackle our climate issues. So that um, I think will be part of the conversation in some form. Um, we're going to keep working on clean transportation. Uh, there's kind of continuing things. I've talked about this before, so I won't uh, spend too much time on it, but some of the bills we've seen in the past. And then with the additional funding we gave to the EV um, charging station rebate program last year, we're looking at just trying to expand that and how it gets applied and, and create new incentives for the, the areas we really want to tackle. Um, Green fees, uh, Senator Gabbard mentioned this. I agree with him um, uh, that our green fee should be a priority and this would help fund conservation efforts, uh, green, you know, potentially ongoing funding for green jobs, like what we've seen some of our relief funds go to and what we hope some of the funding in the Build Back Better Act will include. Um, but we could also help fund that kind of green job thing from state revenues if we did this. And then also, you know, putting that towards reef and forest conservation. Uh, waste management, and again, this is, uh, I think, also climate related, but in some people's minds, maybe less so than talking directly about emissions. But, you know, there was a recent report that plastics are on track to overtake coal as a source of greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 as coal declines and plastics continue to increase. So we have a whole, uh, I think we have six or seven bills actually we're working on that deal with um, with solid waste and really uh, specifically plastic waste and electronic waste. Uh, and um, wastewater, the, the number of cesspools we have in the state, again, this may be as, a, as directly climate related to some people, but this is hugely important to uh, conserving our reefs, which are really under threat from ocean acidification and global warming. And so I think the big push this year would be a bill that would require a conversion at the point of sale and then a tax credit that would be means tested or income based to go along with that to help offset the cost. And this would basically just at least begin a process of attrition for some of these cesspools. Um, we need to convert them all, but um, we've got to also start somewhere. So the point of sale means like every time there's a real estate transaction, that cesspool would be required to be converted. Um, probably there would have to be some kind of exemptions in the law, but um, it would um, it would get a lot of them and it would catch capture them at a point in time where there's like financing options on the table to help um, facilitate that. And then this is just a, um, other, other issues I didn't want to leave off, Green Amendment uh, that Senator Gabbard mentioned, I also support that. And then uh, Red Hill, um, you know, I know this is a, not, this meeting's not specifically about that, but I think that what we've been watching happen over the past week has been really shocking and um, has really brought home the worst case scenario. I mean, we're watching it play out and imagining that happening more broadly to Oahu residents is it's like no level of risk is acceptable fundamentally. So we're going to have to tackle the Red Hill problem um, for sure. So I'll stop there. I don't want to take up too much time. And thank you. Thank you, Representative Lowen. I, I'd like to ask you a question first about the Green Constitutional Amendment. It got through the Senate unanimously last year, and it passed your committee. And I wonder what you think the prospects are for passing the legislature this year. I mean, we're willing to pass it out of my committee. I can't. I can't really speak to. I'm not quite sure what the um, the reason for not continuing to move it forward was. So, 
I, I, I mean, I hate to say what are the chances. We just, we can't know until we, we are there. Okay. Another question I have for you is relating to, you mentioned geothermal, which is a great resource potentially, I think, for if it can be worked out for the Big Island. Uh, but let's turn to Oahu. Uh, where you know the majority of the population lives, what can what can be done on Oahu to uh, to continue to develop power resource alternative power resources so that we can reduce emissions, and also what can we do on sequestration of carbon? Sure, I mean I think there's still low hanging fruit on Oahu, so there there is uh, like as the the county continues to move forward or the utility continues to move forward on Oahu with adopting renewable energy. I, I think that right now it's, it's like projects just take time to build, but as far as the reliability of the grid, which is like, I think there's kind of sometimes a misunderstanding that the variability of renewables uh, is uh, like gets conflated with reliability, but actually there's a lot of capacity to adopt more renewables and that need for like the, the firm, firm power as people think of it, because really Solar with battery backup is firm to a degree, but that that need becomes sort of more unavoidable when you get to the last like 10% or so. So, I mean, right now it's sort of like uh, plant permitting issues, supply chain issues um, and things like that. But I think um, for Oahu, there will be a need for like some kind of bigger resource. There are like land area issues. So maybe looking at offshore wind, I know that conversation is pushing forward. Geothermal, um, you know, it's not totally clear what resources are available on islands beside the Big Island. Like, it's obviously, it's very obvious there's a resource available on Big Island, but potentially there could be in other places. But it's like having the um, the resources to identify that and the buy-in from the public to move forward on it. And then, um, um, I mean, I think the long-duration storage uh, is a huge you know, is it for Oahu in particular, like that would be a game changer if there was some new technology for long duration storage that came online. Um, what was the second part of your question? I'm sorry. I'm afraid I don't remember. <laughs> it was, it was, it was <laughs> a carbon, se carbon sequestration. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, carbon sequestration, I think the, the um, Things that Senator Gabbard mentioned about soil health are really important, continuing with reforestation efforts. And then, um, as Dr. Fletcher mentioned, I mean, direct air capture is still really expensive technology, but it's something that we're going to need in the future. And Hawaii, uh, it's expensive, but if you have a cheap source of energy, uh, which, you know, solar is super cheap right now, we also have geothermal. If we expand that, I mean, potentially it could make a lot of sense here. It's kind of an exciting opportunity. It's definitely... Um, you know, it's not, I wouldn't say it's necessarily like it's, it's, it's still sort of a new and emerging technology. It's not like at this point where there's total readiness right now, but I agree, like we should be looking in that direction hundred percent. And what do you think of burning trees as a climate uh, impact uh, for generating <laughs> electricity? I mean, it seems pretty counterintuitive. Okay. Uh, one final question, what can we do more to uh, include social justice concerns in our legislation? Um, I mean, I think, yeah, I think we we just have to continue to keep them in mind. So, you know, I think that we do try to think that way, like, you know, with the cesspool conversion, for example, we want to have a much larger tax credit for lower income individuals. I think we'll be, uh, you know, looking at some legislation, which I didn't have in this PowerPoint to you know, do some kind of LMI measure, put some kind of LMI consideration in front of the PUC so that there could be um, some, you know, something, some kind of relief for ratepayers. Uh, I do think we need to shift. I, I, I do sometimes see the conversation, like I've seen this for Oahu, where there's um, this uh, focus on all the projects are going on the west side and the users are in the city. And I guess I would just say, like, like first of all, not everyone in the city is wealthy. Not everyone on the west side is is poor, and um, cities also provide benefits to con to country areas, right? There's a there's a kind of trade off there, and I think our focus should be on providing relief to to um, lower income rate payers. In my view, I think that I mean I think it's the, I'm will, like the idea of community benefits. So when you have a pro, uh, energy project in a certain area, that you would provide some kind of benefit back to the community. That is a cost that gets borne by all the other rate payers on the island. So I think it's something that we just have to 
be judicious with and kind of tread carefully around. You mentioned LMI. Could you explain that? Uh, LMI is just like the acronym for low, low and middle income. Yeah. So very good. Thank you, Chair Lon. I really appreciate your coming today and uh, for working with us on all these important bills coming up in the next session. Thanks. I hope everyone's staying warm, by the way, on this very cold Hawaii morning. <laughs> okay, moving on to our third chair, which is David Tarnas. David Tarnas is currently the state representative for House District 7 in North Kohala, South Kohala, and North Kona on the Big Island. He previously served as the state representative for Kohala and Kona back in the 90s, 1994 to 1998. David is a professional environmental planner with his own company focused on managing development of private residential and commercial projects in environmentally sensitive areas. David is co-author of Hawaii's Ocean Resource Management Plan in 1990 and author of the 1998 law, uh, Act 306, that created the West Hawaii Regional Fishery Management Area. Last session, he helped pass two bills uh, earlier this year, helping agencies and homeowners prepare for sea level rise. So as chair of the Water and Land Committee, uh, David, you're, you're one of our key players. Uh, what do you have to say for us today? Uh, thank you very much, Ted, and thank you everyone for being here. And I have to emphasize, I didn't pass the bills, the whole legislature did. Uh, I am just a chair of the Water and Land Committee, but it really takes both chambers and all the legislators working together uh, to be able to pass legislation. Uh, so uh, you're very kind, but it, it was a, it was a, a CACO effort. Um, there's a, I wanna mention a couple of different uh, um, executive branch uh, efforts right now that all of the folks who are here today really should, I request that you pay attention to and engage with. And one of that, one of them is the uh, state land use review of districts. It's, it was previously referred to as the district boundary review. Uh, the 2021 draft report just came out and asking for public comment and comments are due uh, January 7th. Uh, and so, you know, we, we that, that's an important, land use is a very important part of how we uh, uh, can address and adapt to uh, um, uh, climate change. And so I would urge you to look at that. Uh, the other is, uh, you know, uh, we have the sustainability coordinator here uh, among us today, uh, Danielle Bass, and the state sustainability plan. I would urge everyone to read it. There's a lot of really good recommendations, findings and recommendations in that plan, and it's going to take a major effort to try to implement them. The executive branch has taken the lead, and at the legislature, I seek to support that uh, and support the executive branch in, in carrying out some of these efforts. Uh, the third one uh, is actually in the ocean, and that's the herbivore management plan. Uh, DLNR, Department of Aquatic uh, Division of Aquatic Resources, just came out with that herbivore management plan. Th this is uh, initial draft. Uh, these are not proposed rules yet, but uh, as you know, our coral reefs are in, uh, really under a great deal of stress, and so better managing our herbivores is very important because herbivores play an important role in protection of our, our coral reefs. And so there'll be a series of public meetings about them. So I urge you to participate in those if you would. Uh, Ted mentioned a couple of important bills uh, that the legislature passed last session. Uh, and uh, I look forward to the executive branch uh, coming back with recommendations on how we address the critical infrastructure that will be affected by sea level rise. We have to start dealing with that. It's gonna be expensive and we have to figure out what are the priorities and how we deal with those, whether they're roads or utilities, uh, parks, we need to figure out how we're going to address them and how we're gonna pay for it. Uh, getting to legislation this session, certainly the green fee is a priority for me. Last session, we were able to pass the Ocean Stewardship Special Fund and an Ocean Stewardship Fee, which was really the first time we passed a, a, a fee that is being, you know, specifically charge to visitors or those in this case were using any commercial ocean recreation vessel. That per capita fee goes into an ocean stewardship special fund that would support marine resource management efforts. And I think that was a very good step. Call it a blue fee, if you will. Uh, but this time around this session, we really need to move forward to, to pass a green fee broadly uh, um, applied to uh, 
visitors and those who uh, might be using uh, transient accommodations. Um, Representative Lowen uh, is working on that, and I certainly support that effort. You know, when we look at our uh, the impacts of uh, climate change and how we adapt to them, for me, one that is so striking is the increase in wildfires. And so we really need to deal and increase the capacity of the agencies to be able to uh, address that, whether by uh, trying to take measures to prevent wildfires from occurring, providing sufficient funds to fight wildfires when they occur, and funds in order to uh, mitigate uh, and rest and restore the landscape after a wildfire. You know, one of the, besides nutrient loading of our nearshore waters, which was brought up by Representative Lowen, uh, the other major impact on our nearshore waters is sediment that comes down in, uh, you know, basically sediment-laden runoff coming down into the ocean on streams. And in order to reduce that, we need to better manage our land use. Uh, and I think that's something that uh, wildfire management is a big part of. Here on this island, we're also dealing with a significant overpopulation of goats. And that's a very difficult issue, and we need to figure out how to deal with that. So that'll be something else I'll be working on this session. Watershed management, improving our resources for reforestation, and dealing with this conflict between uh, ranchers who want to keep land in uh, pastoral use and uh, um, the deal and are interested in taking some of those pasture lands and reforest is a tough conflict. So we, this interim, we've been having an Act 90 working group, that's what it's called, uh, called referring to a bill passed many years ago um, that would transfer a deal in our pastoral land leases over to Department of Agriculture. I would urge everyone here to take a look at the Act 90 working group website where we've provided all the information that we've gathered through the working group meetings, the draft uh, legislative report is posted there. I've uh, gathered comments on that. I co-chair that along with Senator Lorraine Inouye, and uh, we'll be uh, proposing legislation based on that report, which uh, I believe will help us move forward to address those issues and also support and increase the capacity of DLNR to do reforestation uh, in, in important areas. Because we need more uh, reforestation for watershed purposes, ecosystem services, native uh, species uh, restoration, uh, and also to reduce uh, um, sedimentation uh, and sediment-laden runoff. A um, couple of bills that we worked on uh, last session that are still pending, uh, HB 498, in lieu fee mitigation. I think it's a very important tool for DLNR. Um, I urge you to take a look at that bill. HB 46, which uh, basically would require all entities that have habitat conservation plans, such as wind farms, to have a service agreement with a facility that would be able to provide emergency medical services and rehab services for uh, injured wildlife, uh, like seabirds or bats, for example. Uh, and so those two bills are still pending. As all of you know, the legislature, when we convene, it's a two-year session. So any bills that are still pending from the first year of the session, that is the 21 session, are still viable and can be scheduled for hearings in the 22 session. And so I'm gonna really work to try to move some of those bills forward. Um, a couple of other things I wanna mention, uh, I had a bill last session, which I'm gonna reintroduce with some amendments, which would be to increase the penalties for aquatic resource violation. Again, trying to increase the capacity of the DLNR to do their job. Uh, we did a lot of work to support the enforcement arm of DLNR, and that's under Representative Lowen's committee, uh, Doe Care, uh, and so we added additional funds and positions, um, and I thank Rep. Lowen for taking the lead on that. But uh, we do need to actually help increase uh, the capacity to levy increased penalties on those who violate those uh, aquatic resource uh, rules. And then finally, one of the big impacts uh, on our forest bird populations uh, with global climate change is that as it warms, uh, the mosquitoes that uh, would not have gone up to higher elevation now are able to do so. And so the birds who kept moving up into higher elevations to escape the mosquitoes uh, are now being subject to them. And mosquitoes carry avian malaria. And uh, frankly, 
our native birds are get are under an existential threat from mosquitoes. Uh, habitat loss is certainly a huge part of it, but uh, along with a number of other representatives, I'm working on trying to increase the tools for the administration uh, through joint partnerships with the federal government and private partners to do landscape scale mosquito control so that we can uh, cut back on the population of mosquitoes that are really threatening our forest bird populations. There's always a lot more bills that will be certainly moving. Uh, and you know, I support the efforts of Rep. Lowen and, and Senator Gabbard and other advocates in, in the legislature but that's just a sampling of some of the bills that I want to move forward uh, and also other uh, um, you know, plans that the executive branch is working on that I would urge this group to get involved with. So thank you all for your advocacy uh, and being here today and I look forward to the, the, uh, the conversation. Back to you, Ted. Thank you, Representative Tarnas. One of the areas that I think may come before your Water and Land Committee uh, that affects carbon sequestration uh, is, is what you can do on the land, and, and you reference some of the forest and, and rancher issues. I wonder if there are opportunities to uh, affect the building sector with uh, bio uh, energy, uh, things developed like from hemp and bamboo. Are you familiar with those? I, I've, I've been a longtime supporter of uh, alternative building materials that we could produce on island uh, and certainly uh, hemp and bamboo are two of those. Um, <clears throat> if there are uh, measures that we could move through the committee that would assist that, I'd certainly be very interested in supporting that. But I'm not sure if it's a, a statutory restriction that's really uh, dealing with, uh, that's preventing it. I, I understand it's more of building code issue, uh, and that's at the county level. Um, but I think that there are some, uh, uh, you know, there has been some progress in that regard. And uh, I, I certainly would support if there are statutory changes that are needed, uh, I, I'd certainly be interested in supporting that. But frankly, I think it's more at the county building code level. Thank you. Relating again to carbon sequestration, are there issues, because I know there are a number of people in this group who are interested in that. Do you have suggestions of where people should direct their efforts from this group? I don't. Uh, you know, carbon sequestration, you know, we want to keep the carbon, you know, as I said, main, uh, one of the big things I'm trying to figure out is how to keep the soil on the land and not have it run off into the ocean. Uh, and by better managing our lands, our large landscapes, uh, we can do that. And if you have good uh, um, grassland management, then you can keep those, that carbon you know, held within the soil itself. If we have wildfires overgrazing by uh, uncontrolled populations of ungulates, then we lose all that carbon because it's all eroded uh, and it's released uh, into the air and the soil goes into the ocean. So, so I, for me, uh, better uh, you know wildfire management, land use management is certainly a part of uh, you know carbon sequestration. Thank you for that. As, as somebody who's worked on coral reef issues, I know how important it is to try to keep the land on the land and not have sediment run off onto the reefs, which is one of the leading factors in damaging reefs, which are already so stressed uh, with climate change. So thank you, uh, Representative Tarnas, for your, for your remarks today and for your work on these issues. We look forward to working with you in the coming session. Thank you, Ted. And at this point, I would uh, shift gears a little bit. We've heard from our three chairs and much appreciate their remarks. We would next turn to the part of the session to hear from the environmental groups. You see their logos on the screen. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of you were here last time, so you, you heard an introduction. And with limited time, we won't go through detailed introductions of the groups. Uh, you can obviously check them out online if you have questions. But these are groups who have been very involved in environmental legislation in past years and uh, expect to be in the coming session. And so we would like to hear <coughs> from each of these groups to discuss their leading priority. We're only giving people uh, one minute. Before I leave the last session, however, I want to say in the chat, um, Danielle Bass of the Office of Planning um, has some uh, has a link for comments relating to the state plan by January 7th. So check that out too. So with, with that, I would turn to uh, our organizations. 
And our first presenter is Matt Geyer with Faith Action Environmental Justice Task Force. Well, uh, thank you, Ted. I'm, uh, the Environmental Justice Task Force is supporting a bill called Carbon Cashback. This bill will assess a fee on the companies that import fossil fuels into Hawaii and return that money to residents of Hawaii. Well, the impact of this legislation has been studied by UH and it's been shown that not only will it hugely reduce emissions, but families in Hawaii will benefit from reading, receiving that green stimulus check in the mail, which makes this the most equitable way of addressing climate change. We also support uh, green fees on tourism and um, we're doing work to inspire climate action through education and events. Thank you, Matt. Next is Charlie Ice with the Environmental Caucus of the Democratic Party of Hawaii. Mahalo, Ted. I'm humbled by this assemblage and by what we've heard so far. It's quite apparent that uh, this raft of issues that you see here craves greater focus. And I think that our, our committee really needs to dive into that a little bit. Um, the environmental, I'm sorry, the energy and climate action committee, subcommittee that I co-chair with Ted, uh, is one of four standing committees in the Environmental Caucus, and we're obviously going to have a very heavy session coming up this uh, in January. <clears throat> um, one of the things that I'm noticing, too, is in all this conversation is uh, a couple of companion issues that go along with the carbon pricing and biomass burning that have come up. One is upgrading the grid the electricity grid to accept decentralized sources. There seems to be some uh, issues just in the, the technical uh, construction of the grid. And the second is to resolve some supply chain issues that are stalling the deployment of renewables. So we're working with some other folks on trying to get a handle on where to go on those kinds of issues. But um, I want to expand our committee and en engage as many of you folks in uh, focusing a little bit more tightly on how we can actually push some of these issues through and take some good forward steps. So thank you so much, Ted, and all the rest of you. Thank you, Charlie. Our next presenter is Sherry Pollock of 350 Hawaii. Aloha, everyone. And I just want to thank everyone for taking time to join us in this really critical issue on climate today. And um, for 350 Hawaii, our top priority echoes what Dr. Chip Fletcher said, which is to accelerate the transition from fossil fuels to renewables, uh, truly clean, non-climate harming re renewable energy. And uh, some of the initiatives that would do that would um, include uh, replacing fossil fuel use in electric generation with PV and wind power, ground transportation, trans uh, transportation with EVs, ample chargers, energy and water efficiency, low carbon building materials. All of these things uh, need to be done though with a climate justice equity lens. That's really critical, but it can be accelerated and done with a, a justice equity lens at the same time. And bottom line is no degree of temperature rise is safe. And we know that a, a, a delay costs us more than investing now in, in clean renewable energy. And so we need to just really get serious about decarbonization with bold policies uh, required by science. And I just really want to thank all the chairs. And I, I noticed there's a lot of um, legislators who've also joined in the call today. I want to thank you for your efforts that uh, will help us move forward in the coming legislative session. Uh, 350Y also is very much in strong support of the Green Constitutional Amendment, protecting the right to secure a, a safe and healthy climate, uh, as well as efforts in carbon sequestration initiatives, regenerative local agriculture, planting trees, bamboo, and divesting our pension fund uh, fossil fuels. Thank you so much, everybody. Really want to thank you for your, your time and effort. Have a wonderful rest of the session. Thank you, Sherry. And our next is Tyler Levine of the Hawaii Youth Climate Coalition. Tyler. Aloha, thank you for handing it off. I'll make this quick. Um, so basically the Hawaii Youth Climate Coalition's mission is just to help uh, shape a just, equitable, and climate resilient future for our communities here in Hawaii. We have three priorities that you can see on your screen, shaped completely by local youth, one being climate justice 
map, uh, climate justice mapping, which is a major priority of ours. Um, thus, we are pushing for legislation that includes stakeholders from communities mostly impacted by the climate crisis when creating policy or making plans for projects that um, will address climate change. We also urge um, for a state level community driven climate action plan. Uh, similar to the Honolulu Climate Action Plan passed last session um, that includes a list of programs and policies as well as actions um, and initiatives to reduce greenhouse gas emissions statewide. Um, our final priority is uh, environmental and societal restoration with uh, both regenerative agriculture and food security, which also uh, includes uh, carbon sequestration. One bill that aligns with our first priority that we supported last year and it was Senate Bill uh, 1277, which relates to environmental justice mapping. If passed, this bill would establish the environmental justice uh, mapping task force that would produce high quality data relating to environmental justice concerns. It would also identify uh, communities that are, you know, at the forefront of that climate um crisis and then devise a method to correct uh, like racist and unjust practices leading to historical and current environmental injustices thank you thank you tyler our next speaker is susan gorman chang of citizens climate lobby hawaii susan yes mahalo uh, we are a national organization, and we are trying to put a fee on carbon and return that fee as a dividend to people. Um, we feel this will reduce emissions, get us closer to net zero, make clean energy more affordable in relation to fossil fuel by making fossil fuel more expensive, um, save lives by decreasing pollution and emissions, and um, Again, the social as social justice aspect of it is that we're putting money in people's pockets, which is the dividend from the fossil fuel fee put on corporations to ease that transition. Mahalo. Thank you, Susan. Our next speaker is Kara Oba of the Climate Protectors Hawaii. Kara. Hi. So Climate Protectors Hawaii supports the Green Constitutional Amendment, which uh, Senator Gabbard um, mentioned earlier, but we'll go through it again. So the Green Constitutional Amendment would serve present and future generations in Hawaii by recognizing and protecting as basic rights, clean water and air, healthy ecosystems, including the climate and the cultural qualities of the environment. So currently, the Hawaii Constitution only protects, protects environmental rights as provided by law. Um, this protection is insufficient where state law or agency enforcement are inadequate. So this amendment, if approved by voters in a referendum, would elevate environmental rights to that of basic rights like free speech and peaceful assembly. So under this amendment, individuals could seek relief in court where state or county government infringes upon or fails to protect environmental rights. The green constitutional amendments have been effective in Pennsylvania and Montana, where they have been used to stop water pollution from fracking and gold mining. They have helped state officials with environmental law enforcement, and neither state has experienced a flood of frivolous lawsuits. And as he mentioned, New York recently became the third state to adopt the Green Amendment, and efforts are underway in several more. So it is time for Hawaii to join these states in providing protection in its Bill of Rights for Basic Environmental Rights. Thank you, Kara. Next, we have David Mullenix of Our Revolution Hawaii. David. Uh, anyway, thank you, everyone, uh, for this uh, opportunity and for this great event and for all these wonderful people who are involved. Um, we, we, uh, our main focus is, is stepping off of passing our, uh, climate emergency resolution. I think that was a good a foundation for what we need to go next. And, um, so all of these ideas are really important. We think the green constitutional amendment, uh, that was just laid out in detail here, uh, previously, um, would be maybe the, maybe the next best step for everyone to get involved in to uh, pass, uh, that has the greatest impact. Um, and that's, and then we also support uh, updating the RPS that uh, Nicole Owen was talking about. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dave. And next we have Bill Bugby of Hawaii Electrical Vehicle Association. Bill. Yes, greetings and aloha. Uh, Hawaii V, our association is a statewide organization representing uh, electric vehicle uh, owner interests and the advancement of the electrification of transportation throughout the state. Uh, we're going to basically focus on three areas. Uh, 
zero emission vehicle standards, which will advance those objectives, incentives for EV purchases, and very important, uh, the build out of our uh, charging infrastructure here statewide and the incentives to enable that to happen. Thank you, Bill. Next, we have Joshua Cooper of the Climate Reality Project. Joshua. Aloha, how are you? It's great Good to morning. be with everyone. We're up at Leahi, actually working at the Peace Garden. Our top policy proposals and priorities is Climate Reality Project, of course, came out of Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth. But we're also looking at the global all the way down to here at Hawaii. So the first one is adopt a Hawaii Pacific Escazo Agreement on the right to information, effective participation and decision making on environmental issues and public policy. That's also built on Orhus. We also agree with our other participants about Climate Justice Action Plan, beginning with formal education from DOE to University of Hawaii. And we also agree with the idea of the regenerative tourism launch with first steps of Hawaii visitor fee funding going towards education. Also really appreciate meeting with everyone and seeing how we come together, including Senator Gabbard on the Green Constitutional Amendment. That also mirrors what was adopted at the Human Rights Council in October. And then explore a people's assembly at city and state level and also locally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement to kind of build on what Chip was sharing so we could do more here to contribute to Hawaii and our Pacific Oceania neighbors. Mahalo. Mahalo. Thank you, Joshua. Next, we have Lisa Bishop of the Hawaii Reef and Ocean Coalition. Lisa. Thank you, Ted. And thank you to everybody who is here today and Ted, specifically for you and your great um, uh, compatriots who have put this forum together. It's, it's, it's so valuable to all of us. Um, the Hawaii Reef and Ocean Coalition's priorities are, of course, the Green Constitutional Amendment, uh, a ban on sale of reef harming sunscreens that are not generally recognized as safe and effective by the FDA, or alternatively, that contain octocrylene or avobenzone, that require the upgrade of cesspools within one year of the sale of property, and of course, to do everything we can to protect our herbivores. Mahalo. Thank you, Lisa. Next, we have Yoko Schneider of Wastewater Alternatives and Innovations. Yoko. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Our number one policy proposal is the mandate for cesspool conversion within one year of point of sale. This has many ties to climate change, for example, that coral reefs that are already stressed by the temperature increase are now further stressed by the wastewater and they uh, stand much more of a chance to survive if the wastewater and the nutrients from the wastewater um, does not go into the ocean. So this bill, SB 369, was already introduced last year and it failed due to opposition among others from realtors. And the way that we wanna get over this this time is that we want to remove language that um, inquire uh, that requires an inspection because there's a lack of inspectors in Hawaii and you can actually do this without uh, mandating an inspection. We have 88,000 existing cesspools across Hawaii and they all have to be converted by 2050 and you have to start somewhere just like Rep Lowen said. And um, when money is available, for example, during a point of sale, this is a great time to start. Currently we have low conversion rates, mostly due to low available funding. Um, but during a home transfer, the seller and the buyer can make an agreement among each other and figure this out. And certain exceptions, of course, apply, for example, within family transfers. This would not have to happen. Thank you, Yoko. Appreciate that. Next is Duray Shin of Surfrider Foundation. Duray. Hi, Ted. Hi, everyone. Good to be here on this cold Saturday. Um, I'm really glad to hear that the visitor uh, green fee was mentioned by all of our uh, awesome legislators. So essentially, this would the goal is to establish a $50 per visitor fee, which would raise hundreds of millions of dollars for conservation and sustainability efforts across the state um, and, and allow us to mitigate climate change effectively um, while also creating thousands of good paying jobs. So um, the I will put in the chat um, the website for this, it's hawaiigreenfee.org. And there's also an Instagram page that's fairly active um, just to for you all to follow. And the mechanism that we're leading towards right now is creating an environmental permit or license through the DLNR um, that would um, be required for any visitor that intends to visit a, a beach um, or trail or park. Thank you, Duray. 
Next up, we have Inga G Gibson uh, for the fishes. Inga. Uh -huh. Aloha, Ted. Aloha, Mike Hako. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Representative Lowen and Senator Gabbard for their continued support of our priority legislation, um, SB 344 and HB 1084, would end um, the destructive aquarium pet trade. Um, as many have said, we all realize the impacts of climate change on our reefs and the potential for increased storms over the next few decades, as Chip mentioned, and with that, of course, flooding. Um, protecting our coral reefs from the um, non-essential aquarium pet trade is, is so important. We've said herbivores a number of times, 95% um, of the animals taken for the trade are herbivores. Uh, they're so important. And this really is a, a climate justice issue because if you think about it, the benefit um, of these animals being removed in mass from our reef really just benefits the mainland and international folks. There's real, there's no local benefit um, to the people of Hawaii. It's uh, uh, basically a trade that is uh, a luxury trade. And it's um, unlike uh, some of the other initiatives that are so critical, um, there's no cost to implement this. There's only a few folks um, that are seeking to restart collection. Um, however, this would save the state hundreds of thousands of dollars because of the cost to try to regulate this trade. Um, the other uh, initiative that we're supporting, um, as Representative Tarn has mentioned, is increasing penalties for aquatic resource violations because we have seen so much poaching regarding the um, around the aquarium trade and I need to really take every step we can um, to prevent um, further poaching of our um, publicly held um, natural um, resources. So thank you uh, for the fishes for more information and hope that um, you all will join us on this campaign. Mahalo. Thank you, Inga. Now we turn to the next phase of the uh, program this morning, and that's the breakout rooms. We have seven breakout rooms that people can pick from, and all they have to do is go to the bottom of their screen, at least that's how it is on mine, and uh, click for a breakout room. The breakout rooms are listed here. We have carbon pricing and cashback, visitor impact fee or green fee, green constitutional amendment, decarbonization of electricity and state buildings, carbon sequestration, decarbonization of transportation, and local land and water. So look at that list and see which area you are most interested in, uh, where you might like to collaborate on uh, various uh, topics and pick where you'd like to go uh, for the breakout room. If anyone has trouble, let us know and in the chat and we can put you in the room you want. Welcome back everyone. Let's give uh, others a few seconds here to join back up, including Ted. I hope that um, those conversations were productive and I realized that they may have been too short. Thank you, Noel. Thank you all for, I hope you enjoyed your breakouts and that they were a basis for at least meeting each other, uh, realizing that there are other folks who are interested in the issue the same way you are, and that uh, I hope that we can get together with uh, coalitions for each of these bills. And at this point, I would turn to uh, some summary from the facilitators of what was discussed in their breakout room uh, and any points that they want to highlight. So let's do it in order, right? Uh, carbon pricing and cashback with Susan. Okay, well, um, as we all know, it's a complex issue and um, we don't want to make the, per you know, um, perfect the enemy of the good. We um, realize that there's a lot of different, you know, things that we have to do but we discussed um, the impact, especially on lower income, but the ideas of uh, the U Hero study and another study coming up that's going to show, you know, perhaps it could be even more progressive if we return the carbon fee in the form of um, a tax credit to uh, maybe middle and low income as opposed to the upper income folks. And also a point that was brought out um, is uh, some people are not happy with the data and the studies that are being done. But one very important point is we can make a, a tax credit refundable, which means you don't have to have tax to get um, a tax refund. You just file a very simple form and you get that credit back, whether or not you have uh, income tax due, because it may be at your that lower, lower level. So, um, yeah, we... Um, 
yeah, it continues to be controversial, but it continues to be out there, and uh, we're going to keep discussing it. Thank you, Susan. Uh, next is the visitor impact fee with DeRay. DeRay Shin. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so we had a good discussion. Um, essentially, it's really challenging to have a collection and distribution system, um, especially when we're talking about this much money that is inclusive of all visitor impact and all sustainability. And so I think that was a big part of the discussion is how do we make it um, have the highest level of integrity and, and equity as possible and um, make sure that the money doesn't get taken by the state for the general fund. Um, so we have to work out all those logistics. And I'll put my email in the chat if anyone wants to reach out to me to have a meeting. Thank you, DeRay. And next we have the uh, Green Constitutional Amendment, and I will do the presentation on that. We had a good discussion. Uh, we particularly focused on next steps in terms of raising public awareness and building momentum for the Green Constitutional Amendment. We had a lot of discussion about the bill and what's happened so far, how Hawaii differs from other states. Uh, but in terms of, of, of next steps, I think uh, Joy Waters had some good ideas for citizen engagement, and uh, Lala Nuss had some concerns, raised good concerns about the need to consider environmental justice and to reach out to Native Hawaiian groups who, as she pointed out, have been focused on the environment uh, since the overthrow, if not before. So uh, it was a good conversation. My, I put my email in the chat. Uh, anyway, it's tbowl8 at yahoo.com. And if you have any uh, issues you want to raise, if you want to join on this, if you want to contact me, uh, please do so. The next is uh, Matt Geyer with uh, Decarbonization of Electricity and State Buildings. Well, uh, I'll just go really quick here. Um, we talked about the RPS. We talked about uh, batteries, putting batteries, grid scale batteries on the grid. And um, if we talked about uh, renewable building materials and how uh, it affect a lot of change by uh, looking at the county building codes. So um, great discussion. Thank you, and carbon sequestration with Tyler. Yeah, we also had a really great discussion. Um, we talked about the bill SB 493, um, and that was basically covering uh, the fact that Hawaii needs to reduce its co contribution to climate change and, um, of course, needs to increase local food production. And so this bill would basically um, provide incentives to both um, well, it's actually to a broad range of activities, including um, regenerative agriculture as well as re reforestation. And basically, it's working to keep forests and working agricultural lands intact in order to sequester additional carbon uh, on these lands. This uh, we talked about certain actions that we can take to promote the passing of this bill, um, including how we can, of course, get the public involved and educate others, um, plant trees of our own, plant seeds of our own. We talked about the importance of, you know, really emphasizing um, the need for not only planting trees, but planting ecosystems to preserve biodiversity um, and perpetuate ecosystem services. Um, and yeah, we're, we're excited to see um, how we can continue to really honor carbon sequestration, um, as that is a, an important facet in the two-dimensional, uh, or there's multiple dimensions to it, but, you know, there is the one dimension of stopping emissions, and then we need to sequester the emissions in the atmosphere. So, oh, stop. Thank you, Tyler. Next is Bill Bugby for decarbonization of transportation. We had a very productive uh, uh, input from the from the audience, and, and one concern is, of course, uh, as we build out infrastructure, how we deal with uh, uh, multifamily units, condos, and and how they uh, how they adapt to that, to, and the role of energy was another big uh, discussion point uh, in EV transformation. Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, something that really hasn't been much on the radar in terms of policymakers, uh, or the I think the utility is as we move the 
uh, ground transportation from internal combustion engines to to EV, the charging loads on the grid are going to be fairly substantial. And this happens in parallel at the same time when the utilities are uh, struggling to um, basically transform themselves into a clean energy grid. Uh, so they have the, the multiple stressors at the same time with similar deadlines. So that's uh, that was something that was raised and it's an interesting point. And then another point is on rental fleets uh, and transformation to uh, an EV rental fleet. One of the uh, um, points that were brought up was the cost of the infrastructure support for these companies, the rental companies, to uh, to support the car fleets as they move from uh, internal combustion to uh, to electrification, and uh, there'd be some type of legislative support for that transition. Uh, that um, that's pretty much it. Thank you, Bill. Yep. And next is Yoko doing local land and water. Yoko. Yes. Thank you, and thanks to everybody in the breakout room for this great discussion. Please feel free to interrupt me if I misrepresent everything I tried to take notes. And I also put my email in the chat right after I stop talking. So the first topic we talked about was the Green Constitutional Amendment, and Representative Tarnas said it's currently the biggest challenge is the Judiciary Committee in the House, and what's needed is a conversation with Chair Nakashima and Vice Chair Mariyoshi to learn about their concerns and why it failed last time. And um, what's really needed is a champion in the House. And luckily, no constitutional convention is needed for this. This amendment can be done without a constitutional convention. Second topic was the point of sale conversion of cesspools. Uh, Representative Lowen is the champion for this bill in the House. And Representative Tarnas said he also supports it. It was good to remove the inspection requirement because some people listed that as their hang up with this bill. And it'll be really, really crucial, as we know, to work with the realtors um, similar to how it was done with the sea level rise disclosure. Uh, realtors don't like point of sale conversions um, and would rather have it focus on the cesspools that are close to water bodies to be converted first. And uh, good news is that there's um, an effort to make this both into one bill, point of sale conversion of cesspools specifically close to water. And uh, SB 997 uh, of last year was also brought up, which will enable hopefully public-private partnerships in the wastewater sector to enable large-scale cesspool conversions of hundreds of cesspools at a time. And it was also mentioned that the economy of scale should be utilized whenever possible. Third of four topics is the sunscreen rules. And uh, it was mentioned that Bill 132 is still active. However, um, this needs, if 132 wants to move on, this has uh, to reconsider a certain decision that was made previously last year. But it's also possible to just introduce a new bill with this or to do this on the county level. Maui has a bill, for example, but it is anticipated that there will be strong opposition from the personal care product industry. And potentially there will be legislation that will make it illegal to consider this type of legislation on the county level. So state level might be the, one, the way to go. And uh, the chair of the committee is currently waiting on the national panel review to enact this decision. And... Topic four of four, herbivore protection and aquarium fishing. Now we were cut off here, unfortunately, but Representative Tarnas got in that it's currently before his committee and it needs to go through the process in which it is right now in order to move forward. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Yoko. We're a, a little over what we were supposed to finish by 15 minutes or so. Thank you all for staying on. Thank you all for participating today. I think this has been a great event, and we really need everybody to get involved now. I mean, this was just the beginning. The process is just starting. The bills are just being written. Some of them are holdovers from last year, but the, the efforts to pass them are just beginning now. And it takes the public being involved between now and February when the bills start to be heard. And then after February, you need to show up and testify. So I really appreciate everybody who's come on today. Um, almost 100 people here. It's a great group, and we really appreciate your efforts. Next steps, uh, we can do public um, organization. We can do uh, coordination amongst ourselves. We can talk to legislators. All three of those areas, I think, should be pursued. Uh, and uh, we will have other sessions, I think, as we get closer. But uh, this was, I think, today a good step forward in terms of getting more specific with the bills than we were back in uh, September, uh, where we were more broadly issue focused. And I thank the 
three chairs who showed up today and the 13 environmental groups who spoke. And as I said, I guess it's around 80 people who have participated in this. So thank you very much. With that, I will turn it back to our uh, introducer and um, speaker for the next generation, Tyler Levine. Take it away, Tyler. Thank you. I just have a few more words to say. Um, first of all, again, thank you all so much for joining us today. Very excited to see how we you know, carry out to implement these next steps. I think that it will be interesting to see maybe follow-up activities and public organization, as Ted mentioned, as well as other maybe education initiatives. Um, and my main message here at the end is that it really all starts at a seed. And from this seed is going to grow a, a great fruitful tree that provides generously to all living things. Um, roots planted firmly in the earth, flowers of blaze, branches spread wide. Um, we are the seeds. We are the seeds of hope, the seeds of strength, and the seeds of love. Um, and I think every seed has a story. So it is time to grow the story. It is time to grow our story. And it's time to grow our future. Thank you again, Mahalo legislators, um, Mahalo organizations, and Mahalo to each and every one of you guys for joining us again today. We will be sending out um, a a few documents uh, with both um, the bills that were mentioned today, as well as the recording um, and context to some of the organizations that presented. Thank you, Tyler. And I just wanted to say one last thing, which I forgot to do, which is to thank Chip Fletcher for his presentation. Yes, much appreciated. Yes, thank you. So I hope to see you uh, again in another event. Uh, I'm not sure when, probably January, maybe we'll have something. But uh, you, you're, you're great people for coming today. So thank you so much. And uh, ahui ho. And Thanks, everybody. Aloha. Feel free to unmute Thanks. yourself and shout out Thanks, your appreciation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you, Aloha. Tyler. Woo! Appreciate all you do. You guys are well rock done. stars. Well done. Well Great done. job, Have you a guys. good weekend. Mahalo, Thanks. everyone. Thanks, Thanks for caring. Thank you, everyone. Special thanks to Noel and Matt and Charlie and David and others who have, uh, and John Kalamoda all others who have helped uh, put on this event and, and making it go smoothly. Uh, we, we really appreciate that.